So welcome everybody. We're doing something we haven't done in a while. This is a uh, an in-person episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and I'm joined by Sensei Gabe Trance here, and we'll chat in just a moment. Just a reminder to everybody, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go for the show notes, the transcripts, all that stuff. Whistlekick.com is where you want to go to find out all the things that we're doing. Like the events, the event that led to this in-person conversation, right? So if you want to stay up on what we're doing, do that. Join the newsletter list. Follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick. All right. So good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Had a great time yesterday. Yesterday was a yeah, lot of fun. With, if you if you didn't make it, I, I, I feel bad for you because <laughs> it was awesome. Of course, we're talking about Free Training Day Pacific yeah. Northwest, the second time we've done this event up yeah. here. And it was great. Good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad you had the fun. energy, the people, the people, and just, just the right people. Now, you've been around a little while. Yeah. Um, we don't need to talk about how long or anything, but your your beard gives it away. I'll be 65 in March. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You 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 don't act it. No, and, I don't. And, I, I don't and anybody it. who knows me knows I mean that as a compliment. No, I don't. I have to apply for Medicaid. <laughs> <laughs> scares me to death. But. Yeah, I have to do that, too. I'm sure in your time training, you've been to events that on the surface seem similar mm -hmm. as what we did. Mm -hmm. What do you think was different? What What do we do different with that concept? Because there were so many different stylists. That usually the events that I go to is strictly traditional karate, mm -hmm. which I teach Shotokan. Right? But yesterday, because it was eclectic, you had BJJ. Yeah, Kung Fu, Shotokan, this, this, yeah. this. All the information that I got anyway, personally, that I got from different instructors, and I took different classes, yeah. helps me to understand my Shotokan better. Mm. Say more about that. If that makes sense. It, because, there are, you know, a punch is a punch, a kick is a kick, right? But how you incorporate these into like fighting strategies mm -hmm. or forms or what the forms mean to different people, which was brought out yesterday, yeah. uh, like bunkai, you know, uh, kata uh, form interpretation, right, of, of movement. Well, this is a, a kung fu stylist comes from this perspective. Mm -hmm. A traditionalist comes from a BJJ comes from this, and it just goes boom, 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 and I'm like things click. Things click. It may take a while, but yesterday they were clicking for me really quick mm -hmm. because I got to work with a Kung Fu stylist. I got to work with a traditionalist I got, because we partnered up. Right. So it wasn't just the classes. It was no. the fact that, you know, a lot of the, the instructors brought some of their students. Yes. And, and so you had different concept, different frameworks, different yes. classes and different people working yes. together. And, and even and you've been training a while. Yeah, since 73. Okay. So that's a little while. And judo and, and karate. Karate right. since we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in yeah. a minute, but things are still clicking after that time. Yes, and that's the beauty of this whole thing. You never stop learning. Yeah. You never. Hopefully. I hopefully. So. But and the thing, if a person reaches that point where they say, ah, I'm not going to learn it, they've missed the whole message, I think. They've missed it. I agree. I, I learned from things like this. Yep. I learned from teaching. I learned from my students. I learned from purple belt. I learned from yellow belt. I, I'm, and I'm a fifth degree black belt, but I'm learning from yellow belt. I'm learning from, and I love it. <laughs> I love, yeah. I, that's, why, that's why I've been doing it so long. It's a passion that I have to share what I have, but also to yes. get from yeah. other people. And I, I think that, that word is such an important word, share. Yes. Right? And, and, and it, you know, we work really hard at the free training day events to not use the words teacher and teaching right. we try to use presenter and yeah. sharing or yeah, presenting right. <clears throat> because for a lot of people teaching seems to suggest an authority yeah right mm -hmm. and the majority of people leading sessions yesterday have less experience than you so to to say oh well you know teaching and student and well just no i'm going to share some stuff that i like right. that you might Right. I, I wasn't trying to change anybody's technique yesterday in my seminar. And I, I, I stated that from the beginning. Yeah. I'm not trying to change anything. I'm just trying to give you a different perspective right. from a traditional style Shotokan uh, background. Yeah. 
and hopefully it will give more light to what you do. Yeah. And I got more light to what I do, which I absolutely love. And I will, I will continue to come to these things because the more I do, the more I learn. <laughs> now, you said you started in the early 70s. If I'm doing the math right, yeah. you were a teenager. I was 13, okay. 12, 13. What, yeah. what sparked that? I got bullied okay. in middle school. Bad. I'm not going to go into details. Okay. I was walking home one day and a kid picked on me. I mean, really picked a bigger kid. Yeah. I think I was in seventh grade and he was in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. He was big, tall. He picked on me and I fought him off. But I ran home because mm. it was lunch and I lived close to my, my uh, the school where I went to elementary school, middle school where I went. We walked yeah. to school back and forth. I ran home because it was lunchtime and I was bawling my eyes out. Mm. And my mom and dad were home. I said, I want to learn how to fight. I want to learn. My mother looked at my dad and said, maybe we should take him to some type of a martial art. Mm. Right? That weekend, we ended up at the YM, local YMCA, and it was judo. Yeah. I had no idea. Had you even heard of judo? No. No. I used to watch Bruce Lee a lot. Well, sure. Yeah, on the Green Hornet yep. uh, TV series, and I was like, Man, this guy is great. What is he? He's beating up all these people, right? And uh, that, so that was a, a big influence. Bruce Lee was an influence for this, I think, this whole explosion of martial yeah, arts back then, right? Absolutely. And it's continuing today. So I signed up. My dad signed me up mm. for Juno, you know? Keep going. I'm just, I'm yeah, just yeah, double yeah. checking everything. Uh -huh. working. And uh, I loved it. Uh, it was once a week at a YMCA. It was very cheap. It was on Saturday mornings, and I used to walk from my house to the place, uh, the YMCA. I used mm -hmm. to walk Saturday morning. It was about three miles, no big deal. I took class and came up, and I did that for four years. Okay. And then in 77, I started high school, and there was a judo coach mm -hmm. in high school. He, uh, he was a phys ed teacher, but he was also a judo instructor. It's kind of lucky. Yeah. Wasn't the same guy. No, 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 no. Um, what, what, what area was this? This was in Queens, New York. Okay. That's where I'm from. Okay. If you can't tell by my accent, I'm <laughs> from New York. Uh, but anyway, I did judo from 73 to 77. In 77, when I graduated, I wasn't doing judo anymore because I graduated high school. I looked. Did you graduate early? No, mm -hmm. 77, yeah, I was 18, 17, 18. Okay. I went uh, looking for karate dojos because I wanted to really do karate. Mm. Because when I started judo, I thought, where's all the punching and kicking? We weren't doing, we were throwing. You were expecting Bruce Lee. Yes, I was ex exactly, I was expecting Bruce Lee. I wasn't getting Bruce Lee. But anyway, 77, I went to several different dojos. And I found this one dojo, which was, I, I, would, I had to ride a bus mm. to this one dojo. So I went to the dojo and I went upstairs and I watched class. It was a black belt sparring class. Black belt only. Black belt only. No safety equipment. They were. Yeah, it was 77. There. Almost nobody was using no, gear back no. then. And they were fighting. They weren't killing each other. Nice technique. There was this one person who I'm still in contact with today via Facebook. He was 15 at the time. I was 18. He was a black belt at 15. Wow. And he was the most amazing thing after Bruce Lee yeah. that I saw. I said, I am coming to this. It was because of him. What's his name? Ian Regal. He teaches in Ecuador. He's had his dojo 35, 40 Ecuador. years. Ecuador. There's a country we haven't yeah. had a guest from. Yeah. Maybe we can get and we are in contact now. I love it. And I said, Sensei, you are the reason why I joined Miyazaki Dojo back in 77. Oh, cool. I was so impressed with this kid. And he was incredible. And he was the and reason. So, and why. so you, you joined. You weren't scared oh, no. to jump in. I, I, the next day, I had money. Now, back then, six days a week. $40 a month for six days a week. It's not bad. It's not bad at all. Right. I mean, 40, 
back then wasn't a small amount of money. No, it wasn't. But but to be able to train that often. Six day, and we were going six days a week. Yeah. The people that I you know finally met, we were there every single day. Mm. Sometimes we took two classes a day. Wow. That's, I mean, we at 17, 18, you have all this energy. Yeah. Now, what, obviously, the, the techniques and the curriculum. Yeah moving from judo to karate were different, but what, what else was different? You know, what was it? Cause you know, you, you see this, this kid and you say, okay, this is, I'm going to try this, but you stuck around. So what was it that kept you? The traditionalism. Okay. Say more. Uh, my instructor was Japanese. Mm -hmm. Uh, his English was broken English, but he got his point across. Mm -hmm. He was strict, hardcore, Japanese, and we loved it. There was a Shanai uh, resting in the corner, probably yeah, in his yeah, hand right half there. the time. We talked about this a little yeah, bit yesterday. Yeah. yeah, like this. Can't do that today. <laughs> no, not not much. No. You got to be really, yeah. really careful. I have a Shanai at my dojo, and I take it out, and I tell the, I ask the kids, "Do you want me to hit you? you know, am I going to hit you hard or something?" He goes, "Sensei, you're going to hit me hard." I said, "No, I'm going to hit you like this, <laughs> like that." Sometimes just walking around oh, yeah. with it, the threat yeah, of the yeah, Shania yeah. is I know, is and the enough. parents, they, they're hysterical yeah. because the kid sees me coming out with the Shania, but I tap, I go, like this. Then you need a little bit more. It still gets the point across. Yeah. But back then, boom, left a mark on your leg for a week. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and his, his form, his uh, focus, incredible. Now, if you don't know anything about Toyota and Miyazaki, he would, he came to the United States from Japan mm -hmm. at age 22, 23, and he taught for 50 years in the United States. He passed away three years ago. He moved back to Japan because he, he got sick with Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. and he was declining his health. Was, he moved back home. He wanted to be back home with family and friends because he knew his days were numbered. He passed away three years ago from Parkinson's, and um, it's a big loss. It was a big loss to the martial arts community because he was on the cover. He was a kata uh, champion and kumite, yeah. but he spoke. He he stuck mostly to kata. So his form was incredible. I mean, just incredible. Um, so and he had an eye for detail, mm. like, you know, I mean, real detail. Yeah. He got deep. I didn't learn good front stance. I'll, I'll be honest with you, Jeremy. I didn't learn good front stance until I was brown too. I was practicing the dojo. And something is like, what are you doing? I said, front stance. He goes, that's not front stance. This is front stance. <laughs> like this. It changed everything. What, what was it he was changing? My hip was not in the right place. Okay. He moved my hip just a little bit, and I felt the difference right away. And I've been doing front stance like that since mm -hmm. that time but brown two yeah brown two I said, i'm thinking of myself i didn't say this i i wouldn't dare sensei why didn't you tell me this a long time ago that wasn't his message it, he he didn't tell you everything at one time little by little by little but brown brown two really <clears throat> like this changed everything that's the detail that that kept everybody there, I mm. think, you know, but he's been on the cover of Karate Illustrated, uh, uh, martial arts magazine, this official Karate magazine, this magazine, this magazine. He was everybody, well respected. Yeah, everybody talked about him. Everybody talked about him. back then. People today they don't they don't know sure. they don't know the name. But but at some point you left that school. When when did that happen? Uh, in eighty four, okay. when I got married and the first time. I got married and my wife at the time and I moved to uh, Massachusetts, Boston. Mm -hmm. Her family was in Rhode Island uh, and they and she wanted to move to New England yeah. right? because Rhode Island and, and Massachusetts are not that far away from New No, right? No, in fact, as, as a New Englander, some people will say that Rhode Island is the biggest yeah. city in, in New England. Yeah. Okay. So they were in Rhode Island, and Cumberland, Rhode Island, and we moved to uh, Brighton, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. This was my first dojo after coming out of Miyazaki. Failed miserably. miserably. You opened a dojo. I did. It was my dojo. My my wife didn't have anything to I opened a dojo. Miserable. 
Why? Because I thought I knew everything. I thought if I just taught this, but there's a whole business side. There's a whole business side to it. Now, um, yeah, so I thought I knew how to do this. Mm. I didn't. I didn't know. In, in hindsight, what were you missing? What were the pieces? Okay. First of all, I was accepting cash at the dojo okay. instead of having a, some type of a recurring billing system. People don't, back then, I don't know now, people don't pay on time. They still don't pay on time. Okay. So my bills, I have to pay my bills, but my cash inflow wasn't coming in at the right time because people don't pay on time. Now, today, with technology and everything, I have a billing system, yeah. um, and it's recurring billing. It's yeah. like it works like a gym. Yep. Okay, a gym has all these people. They can't keep track of all these people and have people paying cash. And it won't work. It won't work. So the, the the payments now, my tuition payments for my students, they come out automatically, the same day every single. Yeah. So you can, you can plan things. So you didn't have that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was there anything else? Um, the area that I chose was mm -hmm. not really good. Did you pick, Economically, it wasn't good. You picked a place that probably the space was really inexpensive. It was. But you didn't it worry was. about, you know, the demographics no. of the people around. And okay. I, that should makes have, sense. I should have done my homework. I should have done my due diligence. But it was close to where my wife and I were living at, sure. at an apartment. I could walk there. Convenient? So, yeah, very convenient. And uh, it just... How, how long did you last? <sighs> Maybe, maybe two years. Okay. I don't. Yeah. If, if did it you, have, do you have, a, have a job as well? Yeah, I was working at a fitness center uh, at the same time uh, as a um, not not personal trainer, uh, just like in the office, yeah. stuff like that, you know, and things like that. But uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from that experience. I'm sure. Yeah, a lot. Okay. So, so, uh, so you shut down the school after a couple of years, you know, uh, I'm, I'm guessing you're probably behind on some bills. Oh, you're yeah. probably feeling a little dejected, putting a, maybe a sour taste in your mouth yeah. at the very least about running a school, maybe even about martial arts in general. But in conjunction with that failing, my wife and I went through a divorce. That's a lot at once. Yes. And we had a child together. Oof. It was bad. It was bad. My mother, well, back then and my sister drove up from New York where I'm originally from to Massachusetts to come and pick me up mm -hmm. my mother was in tears my mother I'm not gonna get it sure, my sure. mother was in tears and I went back to New York and I worked for my sensei again because I worked for him from 79 to 84 mm -hmm. moved to Massachusetts opened up my dojo failed came back like I, I i after the dojo closed i hung around because i wanted to be close to my daughter at the time and i got back to my mother and sister picked me up in like nine i want to say 89 90. Okay. then i came back and i said since i said sensei i need a job he goes come on let's go i started teaching for him i became the program director we ran everything i ran everything I was the guy and I was so you're, you're learning all the pieces you didn't have exactly and what happened was he hired this guy Howard Chung of the Chung family the Chung family okay there was Howard there was Helen the sister mm -hmm. uh, and the other brother I forgot his name but they were the nephews of Jun Ri oh okay Jun restarted with all the, the safety yeah. equipment yeah. and everything. They were they were his nephews and nieces. John, Helen, and Howard. That's who. Howard was a shark in business. He was a shark. That dojo, my sensei's dojo, was making five thousand dollars a month. When he came in, it was making thirty grand per month. Wow. Back That's not the, all safety gear. That no. <laughs> He did not let anybody out of that dojo until he talked to them about a program, mm. testing, extensions, renewals, introduction. I mean, the whole. 
and he taught me the whole thing. The, the business side, the, the formality and understanding but sales. But here's the thing, and... Jeremy, you go from a, a, a student perspective to the business, and it's like, boom, there's this whole nother world that yeah. just, because the bills have to be paid. Right. The lights have to be kept on, the, the heat, the, the whatever, the air the rent has to be paid. And he taught me all of that. Now, he, I hated him. We were in my, my sensei's office. We trained in my sensei's office, right? My sensei's office was like this big, a lot a lot smaller than where, where, where we are right now. Yeah. And it was just me and him. Do this, do this, do this. I hated it. I wanted to quit, but I didn't. I stuck it out. Why? Because I was learning. And I knew later on I would use it later on. Maybe was it the the methods? The method that, that um, you didn't like okay. about him. So, oh yeah, he was just. Oh, here, come back. Yeah, I'm coming back. You're up. He was. Uh, he was. He was hard. Yeah, really hard. But he had a job to do, and he had a year to do it because my sensei paid him in full mm. for the whole year. And I think he was Howard was like 23, 24 years old, young but sharp. He graduated from business school. Mm -hmm. I, I think in Washington, D.C., whatever, I don't know. But anyway, uh, my sensei gave him full payment for the whole year. And he said, you, you better make this good. You better. So he pounded and pounded. Now, at that time, my sensei had seven different schools. All in New York? Yeah, all in New York. What happened was black belts went out and sure. opened up schools. And he was getting 10% of growth from each mm -hmm. school. So he was, he was doing well, but okay. Howard broke everything up into business. Okay. This is how it worked. There's information call. Mm -hmm. Information call sets up the introductory mm -hmm. two classes, half an hour each. I was teaching a lot of introductory. Introductory then goes to extension, meaning now we got you introductory you took two classes here are the programs you can choose from mm -hmm. and we 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 met we had them sign up okay extension after the program finished okay so you did a, a one-year program before the one year is up within i don't know eight nine months you hit that person before again before they start thinking about whether or not they're going to renew exactly. you exactly and then there's the renewal process. In the renewal process, you get them to re try to renew for a three to four year period. They sign a contract, so they're bound to that time. And then after the renewal, there's testing, there's sales. And, but man, he's hitting me with all of this. And all I know is down block, punch, high block, front kick, roundhouse kick. I get stuck in the office with him every single day from 10 o'clock in the morning yeah. till 10 o'clock at night oh wow you were was i was that with holy cow. i was now classes know. ended at i don't know 8 8 30 sure. okay then there was that after training yeah i'd have to close now everything was paper we had a ledger yep. we had receipts that you wrote on it 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 copied into the ledger and then you gave that receipt mm -hmm. to the the person this was all handwritten. Every single day, we went through numbers. Every single day. Mm. He was hardcore, right? Yeah. He's like the, I don't know, uh, Mark Cuban of uh, uh, Shark Tank <laughs> or whatever, right? Yeah. Or Mr. Wonderful, whatever. He was all about numbers. All about numbers. Yeah. All about numbers. And, and, and I just want to take an aside, you know, a bit of a tangent. Here, I'm going to come closer. I'm going to move this a little bit for us um you know because there are plenty of people and I, I just want to throw this out there not everyone wants to work contracts but the concepts that we're talking that you're talking about yeah apply to everybody yeah. right understanding yeah. how your students are doing do they want to keep coming yeah knowing your numbers like th these apply regardless of your business model yeah. okay they called him the shark it sounds like it yeah so he was he was all yours at your school for a year or was he doing this for others too no, we all had to, go, we all had to go. No. Uh, yeah. He went to the other uh, seven other schools at that. Okay. Time. I think at that time they were not, not seven, maybe three or four. Okay. Okay. So he would train those people too. Okay. He would train those people and we had staff. 
we had a secretary yep. trained her too she got so mad at him she cried and she left <laughs> because she couldn't take it the, the pressure mm. the pressure the, it, it was constant pressure mm. i hated it but i stuck it out and i i'm glad that i did mm. okay. i'm glad that i did because now my school is doing well yeah you know so you do this year with him and it sounds like you did you end up being one of the black belts that went off and oh, opened yeah. a school in the area or did you go further okay uh so after i came back i was a black belt before i went to boston right uh i was a shodan first degree black belt after that whole thing fell the marriage failed everything like that uh i came back he had a school in a uh, long island mm -hmm. okay which was I had to take a train to get there or drive whatever he gave me that school he said take over my school okay i bought it from him for 25 grand and ran it okay. uh when the lease came up the landlord didn't want to reno mm. so i found another place not too close i mean not too far away there was rockville center and there was oceanside mm -hmm. i moved to oceanside opened up a big dojo in open side and oceanside and then um for some reason, the land, after the, uh, uh, whatchamacallit, the uh, lease ran out. He didn't want to renew. He wanted to put his friend in that space to open up like a, a grocery store or something like that. So that. that what then happened. what? Did you move again? Yeah, I, I moved around a lot. Uh, I, I moved to, where did I move to? North Carolina. I ended up in North Carolina. Why? The, there's a lot of things. Okay. That I, yeah. I moved. I ended up in North Carolina. I didn't open up a dojo. I worked at a semiconductor company, but my friend had a dojo. I met somebody who had a dojo, and I started teaching for him. And and yeah, that. But I've been Shotokan again. Yeah. Okay. Shotokan again. Uh, and then after that, I moved here because my current wife is from here okay here being washington State. washington seattle area and she her family is here and her mom and dad are like in their 80s mm -hmm. and not in good health so we angela and i met in north carolina she was in north carolina and we met through a mutual friend we started dating and then she goes to me if we're going to get serious you have to be willing to move to Washington State. Mm -hmm. Let's go. I said, if we move to Washington State, I'm not going to work for anybody. I'm opening up a dojo. She said, fine. And that's where I am. That was, gonna, it's going to be eight years ago. Okay. Now, as someone who has started businesses and, and restarted businesses, I know that every time I restart a business, the wheels start turning and I go, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to do this differently. You started, restarted, learned from, right? A, a lot of different yeah. schools. When this you, is my fourth dojo. When you came here, what was it that was really important? You said, you know, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Like, what were those core things? Business-wise? Uh, just in general. What was it that you were going to do differently this time that you hadn't done before? <laughs> Follow the lessons that Howard Chong taught me back then because I spent so much time with him mm -hmm. you know it was like going to college you know it really was because but it was one-on-one -on -one. so I said let me take these concepts but now because of technology it facilitates the whole thing mm -hmm. because of the technology it, it just makes it so much easier yeah. recurring billing when we were doing uh, when Howard and I were he was teaching me people were paying at the school they weren't using credit cards or debit cards or anything like that. Now everybody's using the credit or debit card. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an expiration date and everything. But I use the same principle, business principles that he taught me, just with different mm -hmm. technology. I don't write in a ledger anymore. <laughs> Give to. a person a, a carbon copy of their receipt. It's all <laughs> like that. Now I do all of that and teach. My wife takes care of the taxes all that legal stuff that I do not have knowledge about and I don't I don't do it she does it she makes sure everything's paid on time 
as far as tax, it's an, all our bills come out automatically from the dojo. So we don't. You know, now, what about the, the teaching? Because you've, you know, we've talked about the business side of things changing, but the way you're teaching, I imagine, is at least a little bit I'm different. Using, okay. You know, we, we talked about the difference with the Shania, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, you're yeah. not beating your kids with yeah, a stick. Right, the yeah, way. yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Maybe no, not no, all no, of them. No, no, no. <laughs> but here's the thing. I use the same, the, the techniques that I learned from Miyazaki, uh, Sensei Miyazaki, I use. Yep. It's the same exact program. Here's the thing. If you go to one of the schools that are still associated with Miyazaki, meaning his students, mm -hmm. you're going to pretty, pretty much find the same program. Mm -hmm. So if, if a student of mine goes to Ecuador to train with um, Mr. Regal, Ian Regal in Ecuador, um, they, they can hang. Yeah. They can hang, okay? Because we're all from Miyazaki. And he taught a certain way, and we basically all teach that same way. Um, that's, I, I'm not a, I, I joke around a lot. I have fun. There was really no fun at <laughs> me. I mean, it was, I mean, we, we had, we, we had a good time and, uh, but now it's, it's, I'm more laxed. I'm all uh, you know. Um, do you have more fun teaching in that way? I than, do. Than you did when it was I strict? do. But here's the thing. When it's time to get down to, to business, we get down to business. Sure. You know, we, we, there's a time and a place. And everybody knows that time. I know that time and a place. And I try to set that atmosphere that people know that time and I place. I call it serious fun. It is serious fun. It really is. And people learn. I got good students. You know, I, I I'm, you know. They're my students, so I'm kind of biased. But yeah, they're, sure. they're good. They're good. Uh, can they be better? Of course. Yeah. Can I be better? Of course. I can teach better. Again, like I'm still learning. Yeah. People learn at different levels. They learn in different ways. There's auditory. There's visual. There's tactile. There's a combination of all three or four, whatever. And as an instructor, I have to pick on that, pick up on that all the time. I think people are basically the same from the 70s, 80s, maybe, and now people are basically the same. Here's the thing. Back then, when I was training and other people were training at Miyazaki's, we didn't have, we didn't practice karate, basketball, mm -hmm. soccer, swimming, gymnast. Today, whoosh, whoosh, kids are all over. The, I hear stories from parents. I got to drive my kid here. Then I got to pick this kid up. I got to drive him here. So we were going six days a week. A lot of my students, my, my, my kids are not going six days a week. I'm also open on, on the first and third Sunday of every month. Mm -hmm. So there's a seventh day, two times, you know, that you can come. They don't come because they're doing this. They're doing it. And I get that. I get that. Uh, the parents, but I'm guessing some of them do. Some. Oh, yeah. I, I, a lot of my team members do. Okay. I got a, a nice team, maybe 25 close to 30 people on my team, kids, excuse me, teens and adults. Mm -hmm. Okay. M mostly kids, you know, kids, a as far as a business thing, uh, for a dojo, really all your bread and butter, I think, because kids grow up to be teenagers, teenagers, get to the, and hopefully they stay mm -hmm. and they bring their kids and they bring their kids. Now I have a lot of kids who started at seven years old right now. They're 14 years old. Right, uh, fifteen years old. I've been there. I've been there eight years. But uh, yeah, they're they're your bread and butter. But I have a lot of adults too. I have a nice size adult class too. You know, with close, it, it fluctuates between one forty five and one fifty, maybe a little bit higher student body. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a lot. We're in a a, a largely populated military area, mm -hmm. and a lot of times families have to pick up and go. So when the I, I lose the mom and dad and the and the, the child as student, I have a lot of father and son hmm. uh, students together. I have one woman with her her whole family at the dojo, yes. you know. Uh, but when when dad or mom or both have to move to serve, which I understand and yeah. I, I applaud them for that, I lose yeah. I lose students. But that's okay. 
because more people come in. So, and, yeah, yeah they're, exactly. they're moving out. Somebody else is moving in. You, gotta, exactly. you just have to get them. Exactly. Exactly. But as far as business wise, uh, we don't really, I don't really market a lot because of the area that I'm in. Hmm. Um, there is a, there are the main elementary, middle, and high school right in that, and it's very family oriented. Mm-hmm. There's a dance studio right next to me, and when little Sally is taking dance, little Johnny is taking karate mm-hmm. at the same time, which mom and dad love because they can get everybody to hear. Yep. And right next door to my school is the dance studio, and it makes it easier for the parents. Convenient, yeah, very convenient. Because it's basically running on the time same time schedule too, you know. So that's good. There are a lot of kids in the area because of the schools. Uh, you have uh, Tumwater Elementary, Tumwater Middle, Tumwater High School, Black Lake, uh, Peter G. Element. I mean, they're all it's all over the place. In fact, when I my wife and I signed the uh, lease, um, well, we're on our second lease right now. The first lease, my landlord, you know, you're gonna outgrow the place. And we did. Mm. So a store went out uh, that, that was right next to us. It was lime buried. They had like ice, Italian ices and stuff mm. like that, whatever, yogurt, whatever. They went out. So there was this wall separating my place and them. I was going to take the place. I was about to sign the lease in 2020. Mm. Boom. You know that whole thing, right? Yeah. COVID. Yeah. I said, there's no way. Now, during COVID, that was hard because I have a lot of, there was a lot of business. So we're in a little shopping center, mm-hmm. right? Closed, closed, closed. The parking lot was like a ghost town. I said, what are we going to do? I, I was asking my, what are we going to do? She goes, you're not closing. I talked to my landlord. He goes, this is what you can do. This is what I'm going to allow you to do. You not only can I teach one student at a time, six feet apart, mask okay so i said i'll do it i talked to my wife she said just do something figure out something you know i said i started calling people within i don't know three hours i had 50 students one-on-one jeremy i taught from nine o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night monday through it was the most difficult thing I had to do. Now, let, now, let me let me guess, because if, if, if so long time listeners of the show know that when when COVID hit, we released a couple, I don't want to call them bonus because that sounds suggests that they were really yeah. positive, but we released a couple episodes. Uh-huh. My recommendations to students and to schools So my recommendation to schools. And, and I want to I want to see if this was true for you. Yeah. Don't give up. Do something on the other side of this. You will be better off if you do. Absolutely. Because we uh, we were above uh, we were below water, but because I was still teaching and still teaching, and there was income every month, because I I basically charged not the same, but not yep. too far from what I. And there was nothing else people could do. No, and the parents loved it. But here's the thing: we were underwater, but we weren't this far right. underwater. We were closer to the surface. Then if I had completely shut it, we would have been in real trouble. Yep. My landlord, God bless him, he reduced my rent. He said, pay me whatever you can. Because he knew if you went out, he was going to lose oh, yeah. all of it yeah. and, and the future income. Right? Yeah, he, absolutely. He stayed aligned in your- and because yeah. of that, Jeremy, we finally took that space. We broke down the wall. It was a major project. And we extended the dojo a thousand square feet so my my mat area is pretty big when did when did that happen (sighs) last year okay so the prediction you did what you could you showed your students hey we will get through this we'll get through it together we're gonna do everything we can yeah they stuck around you probably attracted a bunch of new students because of that yes and when everybody got the green light you probably looked around and went, holy cow. <laughs> yeah. You'd built a stronger relationship yes. with your landlord through this. And now, boom, that wall has gone. You've grown your school. Everybody wins. Okay. Here's the thing. When Before COVID hit, 102 students. Okay. 
COVID hit, 45 students, 50, ta. So that's a big that's loss, a big right? big loss. Okay. Now, 150. Because people still talk about that time today. Sensei, you stayed here. You did one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, 9 o'clock to 10. Next person, 10 o'clock to 11. Next person, 11 to 12. Took a half an hour break for lunch. 12 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4. All the way to up to like 9.30, I was doing this. Kid was coming in, a kid was leaving. A kid was coming in, a kid. Parents would wait outside. Yep. Every The kid was masked, yep. six feet apart, one on one, one on one, right? One, like, a, like a revolving door, it was. This is, this is a common Jeremy. story that I've heard from a lot of schools Crazy. that, you know, they... They were scared, but they didn't quit. No, nope. right, and it's a very martial arts philosophy, as as we think about it in terms of self defense. Just do something, exactly. Right, the schools that said, "I I don't know what to do. I'm going to do nothing." Most of them are gone. Yep. But you did something. Yep. It wasn't great. It was messy. It was difficult. It was. Hard. But it ended, and you're better for it. I bet yep. you're a better instructor for it. Your yeah. students are better for it because. That much one-on-one -on -one time, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's great. Right? Yeah. Um, that went on for like four months, Jeremy, four or five months I was doing that. I was exhausted. Yeah. But. But why, why didn't you quit? What was it? Because you didn't know two months in how long you were going to have to do it. But I didn't quit because I love what I do. I got to be honest with you. It's, it's not a career. It's not a hobby. It's not a job. It's a passion. I, this is what. My first dojo that I ever opened up, I was in my mother and father's garage. I talked about that. By about 12, 13 years old, whatever. No, it was, it was after that because I was taking, do, doing judo. I cleaned the whole garage up by myself, yeah. took an old carpet that was downstairs in the basement and installed it all by myself. I had friends coming over. We were practicing. We were just like fooling around, but still. But you were very early on sharing. What I you knew had what I wanted to do. I knew mm -hmm. this is what I was going to do. I just knew it. And my sensei saw that in me. And, you know, that whole thing. But anyway, yeah, I, I, I you know, you talk about like, like, like fighting, right? You get into it. You got to pivot. You got to move. You got to. You come from a different angle. And that's exactly what we did. And my, my landlord was, I was giving, he, he was, he was still getting paid. I was paying rent because I was using the space. It wasn't the rent that he was originally, but he was getting something where everybody else around there completely shut down. Yep. And that's, I mean, and now today thriving, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. It, it's, it's good. That's great. That's good. Awesome. And I'm, you know, I, I want more. I'm working on a project right now where I'm going to hopefully get more students out of this thing I'm working with. But uh, I, I don't really want to talk. No, about that's, that that's okay. Right but, but here's a question. And, and hopefully I'm not guessing at what, um, what this project is. But you come from a tradition, and a lot of people do, where it is very common to, as, as your students, reach a point, you know, maybe first degree, second degree, they've, maybe they've got the competency to do 80 to 90% of running a school, but they still need some guidance oh, maybe yeah. on the business side. Do you have students that are getting ready to spider out and open some schools? Nobody's shown an interest. In Interesting. Yeah. Cause they all, I hear this from a lot yeah, of people. They're all professional people. They all have their full-time job. They travel a lot. A lot of people that I have work for the state of Washington. Mm. They, they work from home. A lot of yeah. them work from home. Um, you know, they don't go, but some have gone back sure. to the office and now they're traveling again. I got students who travel, they go away, they go stay away for two weeks, three weeks, you know, yeah. people at the top level, brown belt, almost black belt, black belt. So no, mm -hmm. not really, not really. Uh, could I could I train somebody to do that? Yeah, absolutely, I could. It, you know, I, I would start a program, like an instructor's training program. Yeah. That type of thing. This, this is the sort. Of, this is a subject, and um, you know, some of the audience know some of the things we're doing on this front. A lot of schools do something similar internally. You know, in terms of getting people ready to be yeah. instructors and yeah. to own schools. But it's it's a. I don't know if I want to call it a problem, but it, it, it is a challenge, right? It's a very big it, challenge. It, 
Um, now, let me let me give yeah. you an example. For yesterday, right? Uh, uh, a free training day. Yeah. I had two people teach at my dojo. I was nervous the whole time they were teaching because this is the first time they really left them alone mm. without me there. Because you're always there. Because I'm always there. I'm always How there. How did they do? They did really well from what they told me. Now, I'll hear. I'll you'll, hear. You'll hear. Yeah. When I get back, I'll hear. Yeah. Okay. Here's the thing. Um, I was a brown three, I think. My sensei came to me. This was back in New York. My sensei came to me. I was teaching for him. He and the uh, Howard Chung and the Chung uh, team. My sensei came. He goes, I'm going away for the weekend. The dojo is yours. Here's the key. I said, what? He goes, what? He said, I'm going away for a whole weekend. Well, it ended up being more than a weekend. They were in Las Vegas. How much more? It had like four, four or five days more. <laughs> they had a good time in Las Vegas. Yeah, right. <laughs> I had that dojo. The whole thing was mine for that. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm gonna... I said, Sensei, what if I teach class in advanced class and there are black belts in the class? What do you want me to do? He goes, you're teaching that class. He goes, don't let anybody tell you that you're not if like a black belt. I'll get it. I got it. No, I can't. He, he doesn't want that. He goes, I want you teaching the whole time I'm away. So even And running the business and setting up introductories and setting up sure. extension and renewals and this and taking all the pain. There, there's a piece I want, I want to call attention to there because it is not common. It was even less common back then. The idea that rank and teaching skill are not the same yeah uh, but here's the thing a lot of the black belts were not happy i'm sure they i was were. i mean you're talking about sanda third degree yodan fourth degree black belt yeah having a class from a brown three yeah and these guys i was three three two one right yeah 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 so no. just, i want to make sure the audience no, did, it did was you count one, two, three. Count? Yeah, okay. we counted up. Okay. Round okay. one, so just round two, just round before four. first degree. Yeah. Right. Just before showdown. They were not happy. Miyazaki sensei came back from his three day weekend <laughs> in <laughs> Vegas. His Vegas yeah, bender. Right, his Vegas. And they played a lot of golf. Japanese love to play golf. But anyway, that's the whole thing. He came back. Not from the black well, from some of them. Not all the black belts were opposed, but a lot of them were. He came they, back, he goes, They complained. Yeah, they complained. But a lot of people said, man, he can teach. He can teach. So he goes, I've heard. So he goes, when you become a black belt, I want you teaching me. And he offered me a job right then and there. Full time. With pay. Because I wasn't getting paid at that time. When I was, you know, f you know, learning. Um, he goes, I want you. As soon as I hit show done, boom, there I was. Uh, assistant instructor, full-time assistant instructor, program director, uh, and everything else associated with that. Uh, I, I order inventory. I check inventory, order inventory. Stuff that I'm doing at my dojo now, right? Back in the 80s, this was happening. What an experience. Your, your whole career has been the trajectory to take those next steps to... to did you ever think about doing anything else? Did your parents ever want you to do anything no, else? No, no, it's nothing. Like, no. You're, you're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a, no. I wanted to be a, uh, this is like totally unrelated. Well, maybe not. But anyway, uh, 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 an orchestra conductor. I went to college for music. I was a music. I played piano. Okay. Classical piano, Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, Bach. I studied a lot. I started piano longer than I've been studying karate. I started piano when I was six years old. Do you still old. play? I still play, yeah. I have an electric keyboard at my dojo every so often when I'm by myself, which is not very often. I'll go through the stuff. I play a little bit of jazz, a little bit of uh, blues, but it's mostly classical. There's, There are two kind of interests that seem very common among the martial arts community. And, and it comes in waves for me when I, when I do these interviews. One is IT. Okay. There are a lot, seemingly a lot of people who end up on this show who are in IT and they train. And, you know, what did I do before Whistlekick? I had an IT company. But lately it's a lot of musicians. Really? Have you noticed that? I'm curious if... 
you see overlap. I mean, I can see the overlap in conducting an orchestra. Well, I was talking to Andrew last night. Yeah, of course. Andrew, you all know Andrew. Yeah. He plays drums. He plays drums. He teaches and he drums. Does, and he teaches drums, full, like full time, right? Yeah. And he, okay, said drumming, right? But also drumming for bagpiping. Mm-hmm. We got into this whole conversation last night. Because we were hanging out at the same time. And there place. was a bagpiper here yesterday, too. Yes, he told me that, that he Who met will him. be on the show soon. Yeah. So we, I said, what? And then I told him I play piano. He goes, what? <laughs> it's like, yeah. Now, let me tell you something. When I teach karate, I relate a lot of my music mm. background into the What does that mean, Sensei? What are you talking about? Practicing piano, you start one note at a time. Boom. And it's really, really slow. Same thing when I teach. Boom. Easy, easy. And then gradually you pick up, pick up, pick up. And where you get it to a, you know, a speed that where it should be. Um, just the intensity, uh, the emotion that I put into music when I play music. Uh, the feeling that I get when I am playing for an audience. Because I played at weddings. I played at different banquets, I play, you know, all over, churches, whatever. Um, but I, my, my musical background helps me to be a better karate instructor, if that makes sense. It, it does. You know, there's, I love forms, you know. It, I grew up karate, and, and I just, I love forms. I love kata. Uh-huh. Uh, back when I used to compete, you know, it was like, okay, sparring, fine. Kata. And it was, it was a, a statement I heard made about music that, snap me in and this this wasn't that long ago this is less than 10 years ago uh-huh. a great musician plays the space between the notes yeah and i went yeah yeah that's the difference because yeah. if you look at an amazing forms practitioner no matter the discipline it can be really hard and really subjective to yeah. say what makes this person better than this person you know that they're they're executing those techniques really well it's the space between it's the it's the split second decisions in timing. It's the energy, the charisma they put into that. It's how they make you feel yeah. as they tell the story. Yeah, that, it's, a, it's a story that you're telling when you play music. It's a story when you do kata. Yeah. You're, 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 you're telling a story when you do kata. A lot of times when I teach kata and I see people do kata, this is my opinion and my honest mm-hmm. opinion from my background, they rush. I agree. There's no, there's no stopping in between the notes, yep. and a lot of that power that comes from the rest, just like in music. Yep. When you're playing, when I'm playing music, and there's a pulse there that's not played but felt. Wow, <laughs> yeah. wow, I, I'm getting like really, you know, because that's for me classical music. It all, it all has it. Now, when you play jazz. And you improvise, that's a whole nother skill set. You have to know a lot of theory, but it's also coming at that instant. Real improvisation comes at that instant. Real sparring improvisation mm. comes at that instant. And There's a required, correlation there. Yeah, and, and you have to be in sync with the person. Yes. Right? People, yes. Th- this, is, this is a concept that I think people underappreciate in sparring. The, the better synchronized you are with whether it's a partner or an opponent the better you see and understand and feel what they're doing the better you're going to yeah. perform yeah I, we were practicing yesterday um whose class i forgot it wasn't your seminar it was somebody else's seminar but we were practicing um some uh countering or stuff mm-hmm. like that so we were switching partners great you know i got to practice this person this person then i found this one person his name was mike He's a traditional karate guy. And we just clicked. Yeah. It's like we, we didn't know each other, but it's like we've known each other for a long time. And when we started we spoke practic- the same physical yes, language. When we started practicing these drills, it was I I didn't want to stop. Yeah. It was so good. We were practicing a count. Oh, it was uh uh Sensei Shintaku, Mike Shintaku. Oh, yeah. Okay, he was doing this this drill. Who's also gonna be on the show? Yeah. So <laughs> so we were practicing good, great guy, by the way. Yeah. We were practicing, and I came, bah! it was just like being back at Miyazaki's, that traditional, boom. But we were so in sync with each other. Mm. 
It was amazing. And we've never met. I think we met once because he goes to the he, he goes to the tournaments that yep. we go to. And he is with a rising tide karate. Josh and Polly, great people, great instructors. Josh and Polly. Um, uh, uh, what's that one? Josh, I forgot. But anyway, he was with them. And I said, and we, 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 I grabbed him because I, I saw him practicing with other, I grabbed him right away when it was time to, yeah. I grabbed him. And boy, it was like, it was like, so to me, Japanese. Mm. It was that old school, that old school Japanese. Japanese back then, the, the, the traditional sparring was 90% reverse punch. Mm -hmm. Reverse punch. And at Miyazaki, that was that was the go-to technique. Back when I was training with Sensei Miyazaki, so we practiced reverse punch a hundred times over. The techniques, we didn't really jump and spin so much and get really fancy. It was ba ba nice Front kick basic reverse punch. fundamental. Now, excuse me, now today on the open circuit and in the traditional circuit. You get these whew, high kick. And the reason why is because people score more points that way. Yep. The rule set will Three, always dictate exactly. the techniques. Three points to the head. So everybody's using hook kick now. Hook mm -hmm. kick is the, in traditional anyway, hook kick is the big, big technique. Three tough points. to block. Tough to block. And it's three points automatically. But anyway, before at Miyazaki's, when we were sparring, we didn't do that stuff. We did. Well, because if someone hits you with a hook kick, you probably deflected it enough that it yeah. didn't hurt. And then you're yeah. going to be wrist deep but in their that, ribs. That, the reverse punch was the go-to yeah. because it's basic, it's quick, and effective. And in, 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 a, in a heavier contact situation like you probably had in your dojo. Yeah. Before it, you're, you're safe doing it. You yeah. can still cover yourself. You uh -huh. can retreat. Yeah. But it was very fundamental. Yeah. Keyhorn, basics. Kata Kumite. That's it. Weapons didn't play a role until much later mm -hmm. on. I don't teach weapons because I didn't study it long enough. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to teach something I don't know. Sure. Okay. I tell my students every day, not every day, but a lot. I don't make this stuff up, guys. I spent over four decades learning what I'm teaching you. Everything I'm teaching you, I learned back then. And that I want to bring, to, to bring that classical karate to a very modernized world are you choosing that word classical versus traditional because i'm starting to hear people use those words differently i use them i use them interchangeably yeah it was it's very classical to me like classical music <laughs> beethoven yeah. is classical mozart is classical miyazaki was classical was he traditional yeah why because he had his rules and regulations that we we couldn't deviate from mm. We were never allowed to call him by his last name. Okay. It was just sensei. Don't call me master. Don't call me Shihan. Don't call me the sensei. Now he was a fifth degree black belt at a very high level. Sensei. We were never allowed to shake hands with him. Only bow. Only bow. We were never allowed to hug. Mm. Only bow. Why? That's it. That was just him. that's how he wanted yeah, it. That, well, that's what that's what he learned back in Japan okay. when he was studying, you know, and he brought that to the States. Now, I shake everybody's hand. Yeah, I'm a hugger. Yeah, I shake it. I'm fine with that. And I hug my students. I shake my students. But we still bow to each other. You know, if I'm at a store. Right. And I, a, a, a student and a student student sees me. We bow to if they're back here and I'm back here. We bow to each other. Mm. Because it's that, that tradition that I want them to take outside of the dojo. Don't just keep it in here. Show, have that respect attitude. Not in just that, but in everything you do outside of the dojo. Mm -hmm. Five principles, right? We call the dojo kun. Mm -hmm. Seek perfection of character. Endeavor to excel. Respect mm -hmm. others. Uh, be faithful. Respect others. Refrain from violent behavior. Mm -hmm. We recite that. Every time at the end of class, but I wanted to take it. I want them to take it outside mm. into the community in their daily life. But anyway, love it. Yeah. It's probably a good time to start to wind up. I'm going to ask you to close us up in a minute, uh, but to the audience, 
thank you. And remember, if you, if you want to go deeper, you know, we'll, we'll have some show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. I don't know what episode number this is going to be. And check out all the stuff that we're doing at whistlekick.com to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional or the classical martial artists of the world. And, and thank you for your continued support. And uh, you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on just about anything we've got going on over there. Guys, you got to come to free training day next time. It's an incredible experience. Thank you. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, you're, doing is. A, you're doing a great thing. The The goal is to spread them. Yeah. Um, you know, the rule is you have to have a, come to a free training day before you can launch a free training day. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Because now that you've been here, you get it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's not the same as other events that claim to be similar. It's on paper, it looks similar, but there are some nuances yeah. that make it dramatically different. And so my hope is that they start popping it. We start popping them up everywhere, you know, because countrywide. Yeah. Yeah. What we're, I sadly look forward to the day that there's a free training day. I can't make it to. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because there will be so many of them, you know, outside of the United States and also outside of the United States, we have our That'd first, international attendee coming to the northeast one in a couple weeks oh, so wow. maybe he brings it back yeah and he says you know i want to do one in canada okay, yeah we'll, oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get you going there that's too. cool so um thoughts for the audience how do you want to how do you want to close this out what do you want to tell them um i think martial arts in general is a really good thing to get involved in whether it be karate judo kung fu uh budo aikido whatever because it really depending on the instructor though i mean there there are some instructors that don't teach this stuff there are some instructors who are just all about we're better than you we're better than you we're better than be uh, brazilian jiu-jitsu uh all of this stuff that's happening with uh these full contact fights and everything oh your stuff doesn't work against us don't go to places like that. Don't go to places like that. Get in, If you're interested, get involved with a martial art that teaches tradition, that teaches that everybody, everybody can learn from each other. I, I think that's the big thing. I, I think a lot of people who teach that art school is better are very close-minded, cannot learn from anybody else. And I, I that's, you know, to me, that's political. It gets political. And I do not like martial arts politics. I hate politics, especially within the martial arts. We, sh- we should all be together and helping each other grow and grow and grow and grow. And grow. That's my message. <laughs> it's a long one, but that's no, it. No, it's an important one. Get to a class somewhere. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks.